Good. Um, so that's the question function. You don't have to take photos of every screen. Um, there's a PDF available for you. Um, at the end, Amanda will will um, just drop it in the chat and messaging. And uh, you want to talk a little bit about Product Tank, Amanda? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think some of us joining this call are uh, new to Product Tank. Just to introduce what Product Tank is about, we are a community run by product managers for product managers. So it was originally uh, started in 2010 in London, and now the event is actually spread across more than 200 cities around the world. And right in here in Hong Kong, we have over 1,300 members joining the uh, meetup group. So Product Tank is actually part of Mind the Product Group. So we do have a lot of uh, product management related resources uh, like newsletter, blogs. Uh, there are also uh, conferences that uh, we hold like maybe two to three times a year. But uh, this year is a little bit different because of COVID-19, a lot of conferences went online. Uh, we also have workshops and training courses. Um, there is also a Slack channel and job board that you can join. Uh, overall, this is more uh, a free of charge network that you can share and learn. So you can follow us on uh, these platforms. Uh, you can, especially on the Meetup uh, page, because we do post all the upcoming uh, Meetups in meetup.com. Uh, but you can also stay in touch with us on Facebook, Telegram, LinkedIn, Snack, and also the Mind Product YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so uh, we're also constantly looking for uh, different things, including topics, uh, because this is an event for you. We're constantly looking for speakers, venues. Uh, once all these restrictions got lifted, we can actually organize physical meetups, then we need venues. And obviously, uh, volunteers, uh, we need uh, volunteers to sort out different logistics uh, for the events. So do leave us a message in one of the channels uh, that mentioned previously so if you if you can give us a hand and you're interested to volunteer just shout okay hand it back to you Gib. good well hello everyone um my name is gibson Bettle, and i'm it's about five in the morning in san francisco uh, so i'm in the states and i'm here to talk about hacking product here. Um, and I'd just like you to relax and enjoy just and prepare yourself for a little bit of self-reflection and, you know, you look for it. Um, Cause this is really a conversation about the most important product that, that I know. And, th and that product is in fact you. And so I want you to think about yourselves as cereal boxes, cereal boxes on a shelf. And in how is it that, one cereal box attracts enough attention so you can see in the bottom right all the cereal boxes have been sold out um, so i'd just like you to think about yourself as a product and if you're used to building products the the process for that is you have these theories and hypotheses about what your product should be and then you engage in experiments you try a bunch of different stuff and then based on the results of those experiments you decide what to do then that's a, a product process using the scientific method. I'd like you to think about your career using those same experimental techniques. Um, by background, um, if you stare at the bottom, I started early at Electronic Arts, Bang Bang Shoot 'em Up Game Company, and then I went on to build educational software um, with um, Creative Wonders, was my first startup, the learning company in Mattel. I started Netflix in 2005, and then in 2010, went to my next startup, which is called Chad. It's a textbook rental and a homework help company that went public. And then the last five years, I've been very focused. I'm really a teacher. Uh, and since COVID, since my lockdown on March 12th, this is probably my 71st uh, talk, workshop, or virtual exam. 
And then I've been treating it as a creative challenge, uh, just to, to prove to myself that you can be as effective online as you are in person. So there's really three chapters to my, uh, to my, my talk today. Uh, the first is talking about how you can position yourself, the skills right, that are required, and then your progression as, as you go forward in your career. The second, these ideas about experimenting. How do you hack your career, engage in side projects, experiments, learn courses, whatever. And then the third, and this is probably the most important thing or the most helpful for me, is establishing your own person board of directors in order to get feedback. And none of us as individuals are self-aware, so you, you, you need feedback from peers and mentors. Uh, I just, this is me when I, when I had that previous photo with my daughter, I have 22 and 24 year old daughters. When they saw it, they instantly retweeted this photo of really making fun of their dad. Um, and then I just, you know, acknowledge I'm a 58 year old white male from Silicon Valley. And really what I'm working to do is essentially lend my privilege. So tr try to make it easier for other folks to take advantage of, of the amazing privilege that I have. And that's, th those are the things that are going on in this talk. That was my um, my wife, Kristen, on the left. That's Kelsey Biddle, who's just starting medical school. She's 24. Britt is the one with her eyes closed. She works for Rent the Runway in, in, in Brooklyn, New York City. Uh, they rent uh, clothes instead of buying them. It's, it's a successful startup. All right, so that first chapter, um, this is all about positioning yourself, thinking about the skills as product leaders as well as the progression. And I, I have a basic positioning model. And if you think about yourself as a product, uh, I, I found it very helpful in positioning products, but also in, in positioning myself. So this very simple positioning model that I encourage folks to use is to ask the first question, what, what is it? What is your product? Uh, and then people, when they're buying a product, they're not, they're, they're buying the product for the benefits, for the way that the, that product improves their life. And then there's a third notion in this positioning model, which is what's the personality of that product? And so uh, if I apply the same model to Netflix, and I'm guessing maybe you know, 80% of the audience today is using Netflix. If I apply the positioning model, what is Netflix? It's a TV and movie subscription service. And what are its benefits? It's fast, it's easy, it's entertaining, and it's a great value. And then it, it, the personality of Netflix, if, if you were to meet Netflix at a, at a bar or a restaurant, we hope you, you would think of Netflix as being straightforward and friendly. So if you take that same positioning model, uh, this is the way I would position myself like when I was getting, uh, when I was interviewing for Netflix, for instance. I said, hey, my name's Gib. I'm a product leader executive who helps startups with a proof of concept to scale, to grow up. And I do this through strong strategic thinking, management and leadership skills. And then to know me, to know my personality, I do this in a very genuine sort of quirky way. Um, and, and so this is how I position myself. And the, the insight is you can position yourself in much the same way that, that you position a product. So the thing I want you thinking about is how would you position yourself? And, and so, you know, bringing you back to the grocery store, how, how do you help people to understand what you do and what you're great at? And so I, I want you thinking about, in specific, what are the skills of a product leader? So I've, I've brought up a totemic product leader here, Steve Jobs, and you can think for yourself, like, what, are, what were his skills? What, what made him an effective product leader? And this is where I'm going to put it out to Slido. If you weren't with what us, you do and what you're early. great. Uh, my assumption so is that no you or folks are on their desktop computer, uh, but you can pull out your phone. And uh, I've just held it up to the QR code using my camera app. A link magically popped up. And now I am able to enter. Um, you can enter as many words as you want. And, and it's cool if you do it one word at a time, if it's possible, it doesn't, it's not critical. But this is what I really want to know from you. What are the skills of a product leader? What were the skills that made Steve Jobs, you know, wonderfully successful? And I'm assuming that most of you are using his, his um, products today. <laughs> I pulled out my iPhone 
Uh, I realize some folks are on Android. Good. Uh, Amanda, what are you seeing here? What are the big themes? I'm seeing strategic thinking, communication, vision, uh, communication, storytelling, high standards. Yeah, I'm seeing the voice. Innovation. Yeah. He, Steve Jobs clearly is a marketer, right? I saw the attention to detail right out of the beginning. So this is just where I want you thinking. You know, what, what are the skills that are required to be a successful product leader? I, I'm seeing the innovation now. I'm seeing a lot of communication. Uh, I'm looking for, I don't see it yet. I mean, in, in part because Steve Jobs is not, is not well known for it, but the idea of empathy usually comes out or really understanding the voice of the customer. So I do see the voice of the customer. But there it is. And I see the empathy. Um, so, anyways. This, this is great, you guys are awesome. Um, and so what I'm gonna uh, help you to think about is I tend to divide these skills into the product skills, the, the specific skills uh, of a person in product, and then the leadership skills. And if a person's in marketing or product or finance or any function, I'm always looking for the leadership skills as they grow up. Uh, the product skills are specific to, to folks that are in product. And so if I interview a candidate um, for a, a product role, I'll, I'll just put these seven words up on a whiteboard and I'll say, hey, let me know what are your two or three strongest skills on this list? And they naturally ask me the question, which is, what do you mean by each of these words? So I, I define them for them. For me, uh, technical means you work effectively with engineers. To know me, I, I grew up as an English major, so I'm, I'm non-technical. My requirement is that you don't let your eyes gloss over uh, when your engineers start talking technically. The management uh, is, you know, I define it as light process to deliver results. Uh, how, how do you build stuff quickly and easily without being overly process heavy? Because in doing creative work, um, the process heavy stuff sort of takes the life out of ideas. The, the, the creative work is the lifeblood of everything we do. You generate ideas that matter. And then we, we, there is a requirement that, that, we, that we build stuff that folks love, but also there's a business there that we can deliver profit uh, and that profit gets reinvested in, in building an even better product in the future. And I appreciated that, that folks uh, acknowledge Steve Jobs' marketing skills earlier. Uh, and you have the ability to package and position ideas in ways that are relevant to customers that they understand. And then in the last 15 years, um, design has gotten much more challenging as we uh, have had work to create a design that works in these, these tiny little devices. You work well with designers and you value simplicity because that, that's really the key challenge in getting to these tiny devices. And then I call it consumer science. You develop consumer insight via qualitative. That means focus groups, usability, survey data uh, through existing data. And then in the last 10, 15, 20 years, the A-B test where you're able to test two different experiences and see what changes consumer behavior. And for me, this is where empathy lives as well, that the consumer science, uh, it, it, you know, the consumer insight is, comes because of your ability to empathize with the user. And then for all folks growing up in their careers, whether they're marketing or product or finance, I'm looking for, for leadership skills. Uh, and same exercise, I'll, I'll ask a candidate, I, I've interviewed probably about a thousand product leaders at this point in my career. Um, I'll put these seven words up on the, on the wall. If, if I'm trying to understand their leadership skills, I'll ask what are the top two or three skills in this list? And my definition for leadership is that inspired communication of a vision. We saw a vision a little bit, Steve Jobs exercise. And management, as we grow up, it's all about your ability to hire, fire, and develop teams. Those teams are required to, to, to deliver results. And then we saw the strategic thinking. My definition is very precise. It's your ability to delight customers in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways. The margin is the ability to deliver the business. And then I love for people that are highly proactive, 
results oriented, do whatever it takes. Uh, many of us can think of CEOs and leaders who are very, very proactive results oriented. Some of them would do ineffective things like sell the desks and chairs to, to raise money. Uh, and that's, it, it, you know, you have to balance it with some of these softer issues. And those softer issues are really in the, in the field of culture, where culture is about the ability to, to help people to make great decisions. If they really understand the values of a company, they can make great decisions without talking to anyone else. Uh, and that's really the value of culture. It, 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 it opposes this, this results orientation. And then business maturity, you know, this just means um, as we grow up, we get more experience. Unfortunately, uh, business maturity is not quite as correlated to age as I had hoped. Um, but it, it, this is really about having great judgment around people, product, and the business. And then, of course, different domain expertise is required. So I have a lot of domain expertise with both education and entertainment. Um, and if you notice in my positioning, I said, I look for startups with a proof of concept that are ready to scale. I come along uh, with, with a company that's just formed and help it to grow fast. And then uh, usually by you know, the time that a company has two or 3,000 employees, I'm off to my next startup, which is exactly what I did. Um, okay, so product skills. I just want you thinking about what are your skills. So this is April Underwood until about a year ago, she was running product at Slack. And I'm guessing many of you use the Slack product. But when I asked April, I said, hey, um, April, what are your product skills? What, what, what are your strongest skills? Your top two or three superpowers, if you will. She answered, hey, I'm very technical. I grew up as an engineer. And I care a lot about the business. I have the skills there. And like you, Gib, I really see the value in marketing for product leaders, the ability to package and position ideas. And then over on your leadership skills list, she said, hey, for me, I, I'm all about helping to develop product strategy. I'm intensely results oriented, and that's why I pair well with startup CEOs who also are very proactive results oriented. And then I think I have a lot of business maturity. I make great decisions about people, product, and the business. So what I want you thinking about right now is what are your skills? So to help you understand me, I'm very strong in the business. I'm very strong on marketing. In my first career, I was a marketer. And then I love, love, love this notion of consumer science, that developing consumer insight, empathy, using these various tools, whether it's a survey or A-B testing. And then over on the other side, on the leadership skills, as I've grown up, uh, I, I've been very focused on leadership, the ability to create this inspired vision of the future. I'm very adept at, at management and helping the company scale and grow. And, and I've gotten very, very engaged in, in developing strategy. So it, it, you know, if somebody, me in, into an interview, this is what I would say, here's how to think about me and my skills. You can see how this contributed to my, my early positioning. So and the other thing that I've learned is I focus a lot more on the two or three things that you're great at. And I don't worry too much about the, the two or three things that you are bad at. Uh, at the end of the day, you get hired for these superpowers. People are looking for the unique skills, the benefits that they, you, you bring. So what I want you thinking about, and I'm going to use Slido at a moment to sort of get the sense of the style of everybody out there. But what are your two or three product skills on the left there? And what are your two or three leadership skills on the right? And that's the question I have for you. Okay, so I'm using Fido again. And this, you know, and I've done this a lot of times all over the world, and I see how varied and different the skills are. But I'd love, love, love it if right now you use Slido to give me a sense. You can choose one, you can choose two, you can choose three if you like, but, but give me a sense of your superpowers um, uh, uh, on this scale. How are you doing, Amanda? Yep. Um, I'm seeing a lot of design, business, creative, consumer science, technical, 
Man, if man. you see it, there's a lot of skills. There's no one, you know, perfect product leader. You know, like it requires lots of different skills. And so you everybody has different styles. So the 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 key thing is to communicate your style. Manisha, are you out there? Yeah, Gibson, hi. What are your top two or three skills on this list? Um, I would say creative and design are the top two. Good. All right, so we got a lot of business-oriented folks today. And it doesn't surprise me. I realize I'm a little unique and that I grew up in marketing and then later went into product. So I can see that that's a little bit lower on the scale. By the way, thank you. You guys are participating amazingly. So thank you. Usually I have to do Slido shaming, but I can see 29 out of 32 have participated, which is awesome. All right. And then I'm going to slip, flip to the other side of the scale. What are your top two or three leadership skills? Um, so again, you can pick one, you can pick two, you can pick three. What are your superpowers on this scale? And what are the things that really define um, what you are all about? Uh, let's see, I can't remember. Uh, well, I know Brian's from Hong Kong. What are your top two or three skills on this list, Brian? Um, I'll say um, strategy and culture. Good. Yeah, just say it really confidently. Uh, <laughs> strategy and culture, damn it. <laughs> I try. I'm trying. I'm trying. Actually. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, I, you know, I, I wish I had done some demographic data. Business maturity, I mean, some people, it's um, related to age. I mean, I joke, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was making lots of great decisions when he was 22. And some would argue that as he's gotten older, he's probably like 38 now. Uh, you know, his decisions haven't been as good, although he's got a really hard job today. All right, anything surprise you here, Amanda? Yep. Yes, business maturity is low and strategy is high, right? Yes, yeah, seems so. Yeah. And same point, we, we have radically varied skills. And the cool thing is we, we don't have to develop these skills overnight, right? So this is where I say keep calm and carry on, that there's actually a very natural progression to how you develop these skills over time. So this is, I think of this as a career ladder. It starts at the beginning at the bottom, and then it works its way up. So at the beginning of your career, you're just trying to establish your ability to build something, you know, anything. And later in your career, if you're lucky, you actually have a shot at helping to build an industry. So I'm gonna share how this worked for me. The first something that I ever built was called Sesame Street Counting Cafe on the Sega Genesis. Uh, so this is the first time I got artists, engineers, designers working together. Uh, it's, I spent $300,000 building this product and about 300 people bought it. So that's that's not a success. Occasionally I bump into somebody who actually used it. Um, anyways, that was the first time that I, that I built something. And then the first hit product that I built was Elmo's Preschool. Uh, and uh, Elmo is part of the Sesame Street family. Uh, but I effectively, but this was the sort of number one selling product probably 1997 or something. And then I was building a kid's software company uh, helping kids to learn. And I realized that I needed to build an organization. I couldn't do all the work myself. And so over time, we built Madeline Software, and I found the product leader for that, Schoolhouse Rock, uh, Arthur, the, the little art bar. And then over time, I've, I've actually helped to build these four companies. Creative Wonders was my first startup, uh, helped it to grow up, and then it became part of Mattel. Uh, Netflix, and then Chegg, uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg. That's my last startup today. Like Netflix, it's it's benefited by COVID. Uh, Cherry has got uh, online learning tools. It's worth about ten billion dollars a day. And then the next thing, if you're lucky, you get to build an industry. So I actually joined Netflix because I was hoping to establish a new industry, and that new industry is streaming. Um, so today, you know, all of us are watching TV and movie shows streaming, and and that was the industry that 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 I helped to build. And so these skills, if you think to the skills that we talked about, 
they, they, they grow over time. So at the beginning uh, of a person's career, you're, you're, you're handling the basic design and management. How do I get people working together effectively to build stuff? And then the reason that Elmo's Preschool was, was successful is because I applied some of the marketing skills to package and position the, the idea. Elmo's Preschool was a full pre, a, a preschool a curriculum in a box for 30 bucks. And there was consumer insight of really understanding how to delight two and three and four year olds, and more importantly, their parents were paying. And then in building an organization, um, I learned about how important leadership was to keep people aligned, strategy. I was doing a lot of hiring. And then I, I began to understand how important culture was to help people to make great decisions without talking to each other. And then the first time I became a VP of product, um, I call this cross-functional leadership, but before I became a VP of product, I would say stupid things like, oh, I don't know what those people in marketing or finance are thinking about. They must be idiots. Um, but then I learned that my job, I couldn't say those things when I became a VP of product because my job was to help to bring these different functions together. And I call that cross-functional leadership. And I began to learn a lot about company strategy. And then think for a moment what it took to get every device with a screen in the world, every piece of hardware set up to stream Netflix instantly. So that was all about a very, very, very long-term strategy. It took many years to do that. And then these partnerships, because you can't build an industry alone as just one company. So these are the stages uh, that, that we, we go through. And you can see the skills that you're developing at any moment in time. So the question I have here is what stage of your career are you in today? And it's okay if you feel like you're between two stages, you can just say both of them. Um, you know, there's not a need for precision. That's why I let you uh, um, answer um, both uh, of the questions. Um, okay, so I gotta figure out where, where, where I am. <laughs> <laughs> I just put building an industry in, so I, I, I managed to do that. Uh, and, and I'm used to the responses here. It typically looks a little like a Christmas tree cut in half, uh, which I'm seeing. At the beginning, it's less people. At the very top, it's just, uh, very few people have had that good fortune. Uh, but you can see that the pattern filling in. Lots of people who are engaged now in building a hit product or hope to do that. Others that are building an organization, smaller number building a company. And this is a very typical pattern. Uh, Amanda, what stage of your career are you in now? Uh, I would say I'm trying to build a hit product and at the same time trying to build out a team with a good culture. So that's is great. that an organization? Yeah, that's great. Good. So uh, th this, the point is, uh, you know, there's a logical progression to, to product leaders here, and, and it's delightful um, if you get, you know, the opportunity to, to move up the chain. All right, so I talked about, um, you know, how do you, what are the skills, how do you pack it and position yourself? Now I want to move on to the second chapter of my talk, if you will, which is taking this experimental approach, this almost scientific method of form hypothesis, experiment, and experimenting in your career, you can, you can take a course, you can do talks, you can do um, a side project on Saturday mornings, whatever you want. We're gonna talk about that. And what I wanna do is just show you how ugly and dirty careers really are. And I'm gonna share it via my own career um, because careers are, are bumpy. Um, so here are the railroad tracks. It's not a straightforward progression. I have been fired, I've been laid off, I've run out of money, I've been thrown off the railroad trucks lots of different times. And it's actually one of the things that helped me to develop skills to go find my next job. Um, and so the careers are not linear. Um, in fact, LinkedIn has all of our data. LinkedIn uh, knows you know, where we worked in our entire career, and, and they were looking to understand, okay, what's the path to become a CEO? And the surprise was it's not straightforward in any way. Uh, to become a CEO, somebody might start answering phones and customer support and then grow up a little and move into marketing and then move into sales. And then they might even be in product and finance and then back to marketing and then become CEO. I mean, th th these are the way career paths really work. Uh, actually, this is the great road, uh, 
great. This is the Silk Road. This is right near the the Great uh, the the Great Wall in China. Anyways, that that's a meandering path. And then I love Google because when I typed in Google fork in the road, this is what I got. But career paths are full of all these, you know, fork in the road decisions. Do I want to be in product? Do I want to be in marketing? If I'm in product, do I want to be a project manager or a project manager? And I, I like people to think about these forks and these roads. Should I do this or that? In the long term, as the, the way that I think about it is career hypotheses. So in my career, at the beginning of my career, I had big questions. Did I want to be in marketing or did I want to be in product? Did I want to start be a starter, start at the very beginning, you know, with two or three people to form a company or a builder to come along and help things to scale? Did I want to work in consumer software or enterprise? Did I want to work in entertainment, building bang, bang, shoot them up and, and movies? Or did I want, want to work in education? And these are all the questions that I had. These are my my career hypotheses, these forks in the road. And you could tell over now 30 years, I, I, I'm able to answer all those questions. A little bit about my career, I, I took a year off from school, from college. Uh, I went to Little Amherst College on the East Coast and I started a sailing school. I, I, I had 10,000 hours of racing sailboats. You know, sometimes I wish it was 10,000 hours of computer programming. But this is also when I discovered San Francisco, which was a great place to be. And then I, I got afraid after I, I, I finished college, I was running my sailing school, but I was afraid I would turn into a sailing bum that um, I wouldn't, couldn't have a professional career. So I started in the mailroom at an ad agency and I was attracted to advertising agencies because they were highly creative. And then I, that's where I learned a lot about marketing. And then I went off to business school and I went to business school at Tuck, which is at Dartmouth. The key thing is I was looking for a business school where I could ski. Uh, it had its own ski area. This is in Hampshire. Uh, and this is where, this is my my then girlfriend, Kristen, my now wife, and, and, and I, the, this fashion will come back someday. Um, my, at business school, I was doing my homework, my cases. It's just a lot of work. But at two in the morning, I would finish that. And then I was building um, kids' software prototypes using HyperCard. And there's often one or two or three people out there. You might, if you know what HyperCard is, you can put it in the chat and messaging, and Amanda will see it. But um, it's, it was one of the first object oriented programming languages. And it's just something that I was hacking and I was excited about. I did a summer job at IBM, but what I was really doing was trying to figure out where might I work when I was done with business school. And the answer was I worked at Electronic Arts. I'd done a lot of research, and, and, and you know, I chose correctly because this startup ended up being very successful. And then I was engaged, you know, from my kids prototyping and how do you help kids to learn? So that's when I signed this long-term exclusive deal with, with Sesame Street and then sold that company, it's called Creative Wonders, to the learning company. The learning company was the biggest kids software company in the United States. Some of you may recognize this. This, this is Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. This is Kevin O'Leary. He was the CEO of the learning company. And we helped that company to grow and then sold it to Mattel. Um, now, so that all sounds good. My first dot com was called familywonder.com. It was the place that you went if you were looking to, to do something fun with your kids or to buy. Um, but if you look very carefully at the graphics here, you'll notice they're very pixelated. They're very blurry. And that's just a clear sign that this was a failure. I mean, this company died. Uh, it, it, but, you know, I learned a lot about building online stuff. Okay. And then in fact, the next thing that I, my next startup is called Brightstar. And this is, this was to help folks with dyslexia, with a reading disability. Um, it was a neuro performance company using neurotechnology to help sort of rewire the brain, if you will. Now this idea was a total failure as well. You can get a sense of it by the design of, of this uh, hat, if you will. And so I just wanna share with you what careers really look like. Um, you can see at the bottom, I, I ended up being a VP of product management at Sega, and then eventually I joined Netflix. But that period in between, if you look carefully, it says consultant. And it was from 2002 to 2004, which is really more like three years. And that's just papering over a, a few years of failure. That's when I was doing uh, Family Wonder and Bright Star. Um, and that's what real careers look like. 
you know, you have success, you have failure. And if you look at anybody's career, you'll you'll notice it, it's never straightforward. There's lots of experiments and some stuff that work and some stuff that just did not it fail. Uh, and then obviously I landed at Netflix. That was a good thing. That was a startup with a proof of concept that was ready to scale and then helped it scale. Um, and then I went to my next startup because that's really what I love to do. I found another startup with a proof of concept and I have to scale. It's called Chag. Uh, it, 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 it's a it's a wonderful company. You can see me on the left. This is uh, the day that we took the company public, which for most people is really exciting. Um, but for me, I actually was very unhappy, and I'll I'll, I'll help you understand a little later um, why I was so unhappy. So I talked about those career hypotheses. You know, through this experimental method and learning and trying different stuff, I concluded that I really, really, really wanted to be in product. That I wasn't a starter from, from the early days. I, I was a builder. I looked for these startups with proof of concept. I helped them scale. And I love, love, love consumer software. And it turns out the answer to entertainment versus education is both. Uh, I could do both. It turns out entertainment actually pays a little bit better, uh, but education, uh, you know, is more helpful, more impactful for the world. So I could do both. So the thing I want you thinking about right now are what are your career hypotheses? What are the things that you're really interested or passionate about? What are your possible forks in the road? Should I do this or should I do that? What are potential new role, roles that you're interested in? You know, are you a project manager who wants to become a product manager? Are you an engineer who wants to be a product manager? Are you a product manager who wants to go into marketing? And the key thing in this is to think, long term. So this is really almost about taking a strategic approach to your career. And, and the key thing in, in strategy is to occasionally just give yourself the license to think very long term. So, you know, over the next 10 years, for instance, what are the possible choices for these forks in the road? Uh, and the reason I encourage people to think long term, because in, in the long term, all things are possible. You know, I, I was the sailing bomb that was working in a in the mailroom of an ad agency. Um, but over the course of 30 years, which is plenty of time, uh, I was able to do, you know, really cool things. So this these are some of the ideas that come out in this career hacking. Now, if you're into career hacking or if you're into hacking, um, you know, and I, I use the word hacking in a very positive way. It just means experimenting and trying a lot of stuff because you, you don't, you know, when we're inventing the future, we don't actually know what the future looks like. So we have to invent it. And that, that requires the experimental method. So if you take this approach in your career, if you're a career hacker, the question I put to you is what are the right metrics? How do you know if you're succeeding or not? So that's the question I'm going to put to you using Slido, which is what things would you measure? to evaluate whether or not your, your career is making forward progress, that it is succeeding, that you're doing the right things as opposed to the wrong things. So I'm really curious to, to, to hear or see um, what ideas that you have. So um, there you go, we got an impact, I was waiting. Um, so, what are the things that you would measure to see if you're making forward progress? It's got a lot of stuff, don't we, Amanda? Yeah. Uh, they're actually not really metrics, right? They're quite... Yeah, so we're measuring... Things. Yeah, you're correct. Um, you know... Promotion, that would be, uh, am, am I able to grow from um, an, as, a, an assistant product manager to an associate product manager to a project manager to senior product manager? That would be a way of measuring, are you making progress? That's learning. Am, am, are you learning lots of new school skills? Are you making an impact? I see the money, right? Uh, anything that surprises you here, Amanda? Freedom. Yeah, that's wow. interesting. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of freedom, right? My, my last five years, I, I have, you know, I've 
it's just, I've created a very, very flexible lifestyle. I appreciate it. I think yeah. it's direction uh, directly proportional to the earnings that you get. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I do see the net promoter score, which we'll we'll actually measure everybody's NPS in their career. That's that's a really insightful one. The weight of your words in a company, that's probably impact, right? Uh, eagerness to wake up in the morning. Am I at 6 a.m. or 4 a.m.? In my case, it was it was exactly 4 a.m., right? Um, yeah, so lots of great ideas. I see the team size that you manage, the number of startups you help. Do you know what RICE score means, Amanda? R-I-C-E? Uh, it's kind of a product prioritization metrics. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, okay, got it. Uh, I can't remember what all the letters stand for. Anyways, so great list. And the point is, there's lots of different ways to measure whether you're succeeding or not. So I, I chose three, and I chose three I can see in here. And I'm just gonna graph them for you. So my first is, this is my income, this is money. Um, so if you look at the left, you don't make a lot of money at the J World Sailing School or working at the mailroom at McCann Erickson or business school, I made zero money. But you can see things going up into the right as I got engaged in a series of educational startups. Remember that two or three years of failure, that's that, you know, I was making zero money. Uh, but notice that it actually in the long term didn't affect my earnings very much. I, things went up into the right with Netflix. Um, and then I left Netflix and things dropped off and then went back up to the right with Chegg and I left Chegg, Chegg and things have been going up into the right, you know, essentially in the work that I do today. Uh, so that's income. Another way is job satisfaction. So I want you to think right now, this is connected to that NPS, the net promoter score thing. On a scale of zero to 10, or, or waking up at four in the morning, what's your current job satisfaction? Where zero is horrible and 10 is awesome. You know, so what number would, would it be? And I've been graphing my job satisfaction on that zero to 10 scale for forever. So if you look carefully, around Netflix, you could tell I was low coming into Netflix. And then Netflix, you know, my job satisfaction was amazing. But then it started to drop. And it dropped for a couple of reasons. One reason was uh, I wasn't learning as much and as fast. So I saw that coming up. But the second issue was I was the wrong person. That's when I was getting into the two and 3,000 people. Um, and and I, my skills are awesome for startups and scaling them up. But I realized, you know, I'd taken a statistic, one statistics course in business school, and I realized that, that the product leader there needed to be like a PhD in statistics. You know, I was aware I wasn't the right guy for the next stage of the company. Chegg, I came in, I was super happy, but then my satisfaction dropped. So that's when I was unhappy when I was helping take the company public. And the main thing, I, I was frustrated by the slow rate of change in the education industry. At Netflix, we went very quickly from DVDs by mail to streaming. At Chegg, I was hoping to go fast from paper textbooks to e-textbooks, and, and that, that transition has barely started. So I, I just got frustrated. And you can see I'm super happy in the work that I do, you know, with my flexibility as a teacher. And then uh, my wife, she's a physician, a scientist. She's, you know, she's trying to cure cancer. So she holds me to a higher standard. So I let her do this one. I said, okay. How would you evaluate my impact on the world? So if you look above Family Wonder and Kevin O'Leary, you know, when I was building kids' education software, she said, huh, you're doing good for the world. And then when I was in Netflix, you could see it drops. She's like, Pan, I'm not sure, you know, how helpful this is to the world. You know, she, she argued that binge watching is rotting people's brains out. Uh, I'm, and my Netflix pals say, no, no, this is bringing stories to the world. And, but at Chegg, she said, wow, you're helping students save, you know, billions of dollars renting textbooks instead of buying them. And today, when everybody's forced on learning, you know, Chegg study is an online program that's helping people a lot. And then you can tell that she's, you know, she thinks the work that I'm doing today is impactful. It's good for the world. So the, the, the main thing I've learned in terms of the, the metric conversation, it's really all about that one question. You know, which is, and this is, this question 
answers the question, should I be contemplating change? And, and, and so it's really about this career satisfaction or your, your, your satisfaction in your current job. So zero socks and 10 is awesome. I, I wanna know, and this is anonymous, so I can't see the data. Uh, and this is where I just love Slido when working online because it's awkward if it's in a real audience having people raise hands. But what's your number? And, and, and you can sort of think, you know, you can sort of average it out over the last three months if you want. And I'm aware that COVID-19 has negatively impacted lots of folks. But um, I'm essentially trying to get an NPS for the, the audience today. Um, and the way that, that you calculate the NPS is you take the percentage of folks that give their, their, their current job satisfaction a nine or a 10, and then you subtract out the detractors, the, the um, folks that gave it a zero to six. Um, so right now it's like a negative, oh, you know, negative 60, okay? It's actually a little lower than I expect. Um, uh, so thank, thank you for sharing. Um, and, and what it says to me is when I bump into folks, that find themselves, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, over a period, like people have bad days and bad weeks. But if you find yourself in a situation where your, your satisfaction is in that zero to six range for like six months or so, that's the signal that you should be thinking about. Changing. You know, what are the, the potential career hypotheses that, that you should explore? D d does this result surprise you, Amanda? Uh it doesn't surprise me, actually, in Hong Kong, people yeah. are quite uh, working in high work pressure and yeah. there isn't a very good culture of uh, like doing products properly, uh, invest enough time and resources in doing it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think people are also teasing, like whenever they do switch jobs, uh, we, we're making joke of each other and say like, um, you are actually jumping from one hell to another hell. Okay. That doesn't sound good. Well, anyways, I want to get a little insight about why the numbers as low as it is. Okay. So I just want to hear, you can use the word cloud. What could be better about your job? Um, you know, what's, what's the one thing that you wish were a lot better in your role? And I just want to see if there's any patterns and themes. Um, and, and this is the opportunity to learn from each other about what's really going on. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, Amanda, there's a bias, um, which is, uh, going to a talk on career hacking or going to um, a meetup around product, there, there tend to be a lot of folks that are looking for a job right now, that they may not have a job, right? Whereas when you're happy and fully engaged, you, you, you may not have the, the time to, to come out for a talk. So I'm used to that bias, you know, that the NPS will be lower for, for talk like this than if we did a survey of all people today. All right, so we got lots of issues. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Empowerment uh, and culture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's really three things. Um, people like having autonomy. People love having mastery. So they love to be growing their skills and they love to have purpose. Um, that just spelled it out. Yeah. So I see a lot of issues around um, essentially um, the, you know, feeling empowered. I see a lot of issues in trust. You're not crazy about your boss. I get that. Um, and then I do see some of the financial issues, but it, it doesn't surprise me that often these pay and money issues are less substantial than uh, the mastery, learning new skills, and the, the purpose. Yes, and then the people economy. are trying to escape from Hong Kong. Yes, I understand. Yeah, yeah, and I remember the the political stress at the beginning. Anyways, so th so thank you for sharing. I, this I, I get 
think about how much data I have over uh, over the past six months. It's amazing. All right. So career hacking, this is what I want you thinking about. I, I, I want you to be a little bit bold. Okay? I want you to, to be willing to experiment. If you're one of those people in the zero to six, I, I want you to be thinking, huh, what are my new ideas? What are these potential hypotheses or experiments? Do I want to go to lunch and somebody with somebody in data scientist? Or I've always talked about working for a smaller company. Can I can I go chat with some, some entrepreneurs? And, and so these experiments, they can be as simple as you know, reading a book or taking an online course, all of these things, but but to do something. Um, I encourage people to think about, like I call it the 2 a.m. test. When I was in, in business school at two in the morning, I was building kids prototypes uh, for educational software. So what are the things that you're so passionate about that you're engaged at two in the morning? And it can't be sleeping and it can't be you know, watching Netflix. But there's room for side projects. So people, you know, you have some time to, to watch movies and TV shows from, from Netflix or whatever. Um, but engage in some of the side projects. And I actually deeply appreciate that folks are out today, you know, going to a meetup. Meet up. That's a great way to explore new ideas. And then at the end of the day, all employers are looking for folks that are really passionate about what they do. They have because they have lots of curiosity, lots of intellectual curiosity. They're just driven by that curiosity, and that helps them to de develop grit or persistence. And it doesn't matter what kind of company or what field, but all employers are looking for this combination of passion, curiosity that that, that turns into grit, because uh, the stuff that we do is really really hard. So you know, if I'm encouraging you to be bold, you know, what are the things that help? enable risk. So for me, it's been education. You know, I've been committed to learning um, now for 30 years. And yes, I went to business school. Um, but, you know, frankly, the easiest way for me to learn was to try to teach concepts. It for forced me to do a lot of research and thinking. And then if you have a small success, follow up on it. So my small success was I was able to build kids prototypes. And that gave me the confidence to go to the so the CEO of Electronic Arts and say, hey, I'm interested in building games. Um, that, that, that small success of building a prototype. The next thing is a simple life. So my wife and I bought a house in 1993. We still live in the same house. So we didn't you know, get bigger, fancier houses and then let us take on more risk because we weren't as worried about money. And then one of the interesting things about my career is because I, I, I lost my job, I got thrown off the railroad track so many times it, it helped me to, to, to develop the job and career hunting skills. That's the way I think about it. And those are the things that enable risk. So I talked at the beginning about this third thing. Probably the most important thing for me was to, to create my personal board of directors. And it's really, my insight is none of us are self-aware. I am not self-aware. I need to talk to other humans to compare notes to figure out what makes sense for me or not. And this is my current personal board of directors. Um, these are people all over the world. You know, in the last three or four years, I've been very focused on doing talks and workshops and these exec events. I've been writing. Um, so Barry O'Reilly's down on the bottom. He does that stuff too. He's been doing it a lot longer than me. The the the, the uh, person top right is Sarah Bernard, who texted me during this. I forgot to turn off my alerts. Uh, I worked with her on something called the Product Leader Summit. These are a variety of people with different skills, and 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 it hasn't been the same personal board of directors. You know, I tend to switch people out as I'm trying to learn new skills. So I just wanted to give you a, a few of the insights that I've gotten along the way. Um, Greg Bestick was the, my boss when I became the product leader at my startup called Creative Wonders. And I said, Greg, how do I become a better product leader? And he said, I don't know but go out and build your community of peers. He said, go out and talk to the, to the VPs of product at, at other startups because they're going through the same issues. And that was incredibly helpful. And that actually sort of began this, this journey for me of building my own personal board of directors, a collection of peers and mentors who I could ask questions with and give ideas and feedback. This is Irv Grossbeck. I, I told you earlier, I went to a little college in Western Mass called Amherst College. He, he's, he was a, a generation ahead of me 
and he teaches entrepreneurship at Stanford. So I, because of that, that weak connection at Amherst, I said, hey, can I chat with you? And I would go to office hours. And one time, this was uh, probably uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I imagined that I would go from being product leader to becoming the CEO. Um, and, and Irv Grosbeck said, hey, Gib, can I tell you something you may not like? And what he said was, hey, I just think you're too nice to be a startup CEO. And like, I know there's nice CEOs out there. Um, and um, his insight was that, um, that I wasn't gonna be a great CEO. That, and, and, and it really released me. I like, no, I don't actually have to be a CEO before I die. I could, I could be a product leader. I could teach, I could do a zillion things. And this kept me from pounding my head against the wall, uh, 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 which incredibly helpful. He saved me like five or 10 years of my career. This is Patty McCord. She was, uh, she ran HR, human resources, including at, at Netflix, uh, Pal. I would walk the beach. This is when I, uh, this is like four or five years ago. I was like, hey, Patty, I'm trying to find sort of non-traditional rules where I have any flexibility. And she said, yeah, just tell people what you like, <laughs> you know, what you want to do. And uh, I started telling people, hey, I'd be willing to be the product leader, but I'll only do it three, three days a week. And actually, like over a couple of years, I was the three day a week product leader at a company called Nerd Wallet, another one called Life360. It was just incredibly helpful advice. This is my wife, Kristen. She just snuck in. Um, she said, Gib, yeah, she's in the lab. For you, it's all about creative pursuit. And that's when I got focused on doing talks, workshops, these executive events, or even just trying to figure out how to be effective in an online context. You know, great insight from someone who knows me well, my wife. So this board, the way to think about it is uh, I'm always investing in my board in, in good times and bad, but particularly in, in good times because um, nobody likes it when you only come to them when you're in trouble, okay? So I... Uh, I, I just try to invest in these relationships in good and bad. But, and the other thing is you've got to listen carefully. So I'm playing back these stories. Some of them are like from 25 years ago. I was listening carefully to the insights and then refresh often. Um, you know, in the last three to four years, I, I purposely got more people on my personal board that, that, that were writers and teachers and coaches and could, could do talks. It was incredibly helpful. And then, no, I don't meet with them every quarter like a, a, a board meeting. But um, I keep up with them. You know, it's some of them only once a year. I'll do a little tiny update with them. Others, I'll hop on Zoom calls, you know, every three to six months. Um, but this is the kind of investment in time that you make with these boards. The peers uh, are easy, okay? So think right now, who would I want? to be on my board? Who are peers that are doing similar functions at different companies? Uh, who would be on that list? And the peers is easier than the mentor part. And LinkedIn makes this really, really easy. We should just keep up with your past colleagues. Hey, how are things going? And then it's all about mutual support. Um, so you're sharing ideas with them and they're sharing ideas with you. It's a two-way street. The trickier part about your port board of directors, and about half of mine are peers and half of are essentially mentors, finding the mentors. So you're looking for these people that have extraordinary judgment and they have broad skills and network. You know, I, I, so like I've had CFOs of companies on, the, on my board because they help me to pick startups. They're investing in money, uh, you know, they're venture capitalists and, and I'm investing time. And, and they have broad skills and network that help me. And then it's this neat combination of being candid and caring. So remember Irv Grosbeck said, hey, Gib, can I tell you something you may not like? He was being very candid with me. You know, you'll be a horrible CEO. But I could tell, I knew that he cared about me. He just wasn't, he wasn't trying to hurt me. He was just delivering the truth. So I just want to give you a little insight on how you find mentors, because uh, it's really hard. If I create a list of 10 people that I want to be my mentor, one or two, I, I might land, okay? Uh, so my first thing is don't ask them to be your mentor. That's incredibly awkward. I, I get this all the time on LinkedIn. Will you be my mentor? Okay. Not a good way to start. Okay. Don't start that way. Strengthen a weak link. So this is John Lewis in the background. He worked, uh, he was in data science at NerdWallet, and I was the three-day-a-week product leader. 
he wanted to move into product and and he said hey can i talk to you so our weak link we were both at nerd wallet and i actually enjoy talking with john so you're looking for personality fit you know people that like you and you like them and then it's not apparent but they have little tests so with john i say john uh, let's set up lunch five weeks from now. Okay, a very weird idea, but I was just testing him to see if he could re remember to do it. He cared enough about it tomorrow, enough to do it to schedule because my, my my schedule is really hard. Um, would he do it? And, and like every five weeks, there he was, you know, with me, and that was a test. And then the tr hardest thing, but it's actually easier than you think. Try to create value for your mentor. So John Liu, you know, I said, well, you want to build products, like you should find experiments, stuff that you can build. And he said, well, do you know any, hey, Gib, do you know some startups I can join on Saturday? I didn't have anything. And then we were talking for a while and I finally got frustrated. I said, John, just freaking go out and build me, build me a website. Uh, I need a, you know, a baby website. He said, I can't do that. And I said, yes, you can. So I gave him my credit card and I sent him to Squarespace um, and on Monday, he had created a, a website for me. And so that was great practice and great learning for him and building product. But that was an example of him creating value for me. Um, and so here's my little, you know, insight on mentors. Uh, and this is for me. So I, I think about what emails I answer and what I don't, okay? So you, you, you try to get inside the head of this potential mentor. And all of these relationships are gonna start with an email in today's current environment, okay? Um, but you're really trying to understand what that mentor is most interested in and less interested in, and what is the value you can create for them. So at the top, um, I put, will you be my mentor, okay? There is a very low probability if I get an email saying that. And, and at the bottom, I, you know, I got the most wonderful email this week. Here's my perspective, Gib, on your consumer versus enterprise tweets. I, I'm very engaged in consumer uh, work, and I was trying to learn much more about what it's like to be an enterprise software, a B2B product manager. And this person had read my tweets and then found my email and sent me this email, you know, describing, okay, here are all the ways to think about what's different. Like, I, I responded to that email within three minutes, okay? And that's how you begin to form a relationship with someone that you hope will be your mentor. You have to sort of get inside your heads and figure out what they value and what they don't, right? And, and I, I'm sharing, being transparent about what, what interests me or not, or what I need or what I don't. Um, but you have to do this for, you know, if you've got 10 people on your potential mentor list, think this way. And I know that you'll get two of them to sort of help you in the long term. All right, so I'm gonna bring things home now. Um, and, and I'm hoping I've inspired that self-reflection. I hope it got you thinking about your career in, in a different way. So for those folks that have a zero to six, the question I want you asking is what would you, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And I think it is fear that holds most of us back. So if you found yourself over the last six to 12 months, you know, at that one, two, three, four job satisfaction, you need to engage in, 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 in all the questions that I've been asking you today, okay? I'd like you to take some action. And the kind of action that I'm encouraging you to engage in is what I've been talking about. How do you position yourself via these product and those leadership skills? And where are you on that career progression ladder? What are the next skills that you want to develop? And then I'd love you to form these hypotheses and take a moment to think long term about those forks and those roads and how you can begin to experiment with these different ideas via side projects or reading a book or taking an online course or, 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 or any of these things. And then I don't want you to go through this alone. I want you to build that personal board of directors. In the long term, it's gonna be about half peers and finding peers is easy. 
Like if you have a list of 10, I'm guessing eight out of 10, you'll figure out how to way to create a relationship. And then on the other, the more challenging part, but really worthwhile is finding those mentor relationships. And this is the way I think about hacking your product career. At the end of the day, if I came back to you all a year from now, I'd love to see 30 or 40% that had a nine or a 10, okay? And I'd love to see, you know, another 40% that had a seven or an eight. I mean, seven or eight in job satisfaction is really quite good. Um, and what I'm hoping for all of you is you get to that place where your career sat is an eight. And it's just a wonderful and neat place to be. So with that, I'll say thank you. If you know me, I'm not quite done. There's something else important that I'm going to do. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm a street performer, like doing my best to breathe fire, et cetera. Um, and this is that awkward moment where I'm going to be passing the hat. And um, street performers pass the hat and ask you for money. I'm not asking you for money. I would just love your feedback. So right now, if you hold up your phone as though you're taking a photo, you a link will magically pop up from SurveyMonkey. And SurveyMonkey, zero socks, 10 is great. Choose any number you want on that scale. And then I would love it if you also gave me one idea about something you enjoyed about this talk and one idea about ways that would make it better. This is my 543rd SurveyMonkey um, result for my talks, workshops, and exec events. The, the feedback's been amazingly helpful. Uh, and this is how I've helped navigate the creative challenge of doing my last 70 talks since March 12th have all been online. So you know, I thank you in advance for your for the insight and learning. I'm guessing that uh, Amanda's been dropping links yep. like crazy into the chat and messaging. Um, that baby website at www.gibsonbiddle.com, I put a link towards the top of it. It'll say um, product tank Hong Kong beeps. There's a link, it's got the survey monkey link, it's got the PDF for today's presentation, and also an article for uh, something I wrote called Hacking Your Product Leader Career on Medium. It's got like 4,000 claps, so people have enjoyed it. The NPS for that article is in the 80s, so it's, uh, just so you know, 50 is considered good or very good, 70s world class, so people, if you see something in your 80s, it means that people are really enjoying it. It's been helpful to folks. Um, Amanda, were you able to drop some stuff into the chat messaging? Some yeah, links? I've dropped the links on um, the chat window. Yeah, I know in Zoom, those links, they, they're not immediately clickable, so you have to copy and paste. It's kind of a pain. Um, I've had Zoom people on my talks, so I'm, I'm always nicely encouraging them to fix stuff like that. And this is that moment where I, I totally do say thank you. Um, so thanks a ton for, for being out with me this evening. Um, um, it's been great to be with you. I have time. Um, so I'll hang out and answer questions uh, as long as Amanda is willing to stay up. Yep. Um, you can ask questions in Slido. Amanda um, will read the questions. You can ask it in chat and messaging. But you can also just unmute yourself and ask a question out loud. Um, so I'll ask questions until people kind of run out of energy. I see 13 questions on okay. Slido. So. I could just pick some. Um, I see Anonymous asks you, what skills distinguish CPO from just a good product manager? Yeah, so I think that question is, um, how do folks get from product manager to VP of product or being the chief product officer? Um, that is all about, remember the skills on the right, the leadership skills? Um, you know, I put um, I put leadership, management, strategy, proactive, results-oriented culture. Those are all the skills that help people to develop as leaders. Okay, um, and and um, gosh, you know, for me, the, probably some of the biggest challenges are hiring and recruiting. That's that's the as you develop as a leader, that's what management is all about. So for most of my career, when I was a VP of product or chief product officer, I spent one, and, one to two days a week recruiting. Okay? That's just reality, one and a half days a week. And, and 
typically. Um, so that's a big transition that's hard for a lot of folks. And then I, you know, leadership, uh, you can develop skills. You know, I, I've, I've always had been sort of a natural leader because I've learned how to communicate effectively. You know, and I was always the captain of whatever sports team I was on. In the context of product, I, I learned a lot about strategy. So helping to, you know, create that inspired communication of a vision and developing a strategy, you know, that's just hard work. Um, so those are the things that were super helpful to me. But it's just all about the, the, the list of things on the right side, the leadership skills. Good question. Thank you. So uh, there's a question. How can I start product hack if I don't have technical knowledge? Yeah, so newsflash, I don't have technical knowledge. Okay. <laughs> like when I joined Netflix, I had actually interviewed with Yahoo. This is like 2004, 2005. And they said, hey, Gib, we don't think you're the right person for the job because you don't have enough technical depth. And I said, fine. So then I, I was very far along in the conversations with Netflix. And I said, hey, I just want you to understand I'm going to be the only English major in a building with like 100 engineers. And they said, that's okay. We're looking for something different. And, and, and it obviously worked out. Um, there's just, you know, I just want to reinforce it. So I didn't let my eyes gloss over. I mean, I worked very effectively with engineers over my career. And, and I asked them, you know, why? Like, why do you like working with me? And they said, Give, you're very cogent about describing the strategy. You, you know, you help keep people going in the right direction. But you're also very thoughtful about the consumer science. You know, you believe very strongly in data and A-B testing to inform decision making. Um, and, 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 you know, if you're, when I was working with engineers, you, you always talk using data, okay? Um, and it didn't bother them that, that I wasn't strong technically because I, I was very cogent about the strategy and the vision. And I talked via data, uh, which is, for me, I call that consumer science. Anyways, many paths to success. Um, so it's about finding the right company that's looking for the skills that you have. For your superpowers there's another the other way around question what is your advice on moving from an engineering role to a product management role yeah for some reason engineers get very afraid of that i never understand it like you're in great shape <laughs> you know your superpower is going to be about the technical knowledge and engineering. You're going to work incredibly effectively with engineers. Um, so just be aware of all the stuff that you don't know. Um, for most engineers making that shift, the, the, the leadership often doesn't come naturally and the strategy doesn't come naturally. Um, but those are, those are learnable skills. Um, you know, and you probably already understand the consumer science, you know, the A-B testing, et cetera. Anyways, the key thing is, you know, start talking to folks in product about the job so you can understand. And also, most of these transitions happen within your same organization. Um, you know, if you're going from engineering to product, you're probably going to do it at your current company. They're willing to take on that risk. Um, anyways, start having lunch with people in product to understand the job better. And I think you'll be encouraged. So Tom would like to check with you. Um, you have mentioned about owning your strengths. What about weaknesses? What are some of your technical weaknesses that could hinder one's career growth? Yeah, that's a great question. I think about this. OK, so. Remember on the left-hand list, the product skills, I put this notion of consumer science. You know, if, if I talk to a product leader that has no real interest or skills in consumer science, they're not interested in using data to make decisions, or they're, they don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, talking to customers and focus groups and qualitative, that for me is a turnoff, okay? Um, you know, it's, it's like that might disqualify a candidate for me. Like if I, if I talk to a candidate who, who just believes they know the answer, 
okay? So for instance, uh, there's gotta be, you may not be like, actually in consumer science, uh, like in Netflix, everybody's really strong quantitatively. Um, you know, they're really strong about design, execution, analyzing A-B tests. You know, I, I was good enough, but but I was actually quite different because I I was good about really via qualitative and usability in interviews, really understanding what was going on in a customer's head. So it just differentiated me a little. Anyways, there are some skills, some basic skills that you have to have. And the consumer science, you know, it's, it's a non-starter if somebody doesn't really believe in it for me. Okay. The other ones, um, you gotta have some basic skills. Go um, ahead. Yeah. Charles would like to check with you, like uh, how to balance between making a perfect product and fast to market products and how to define the must have features for a new product. That sounds like a, that sounds like a book. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. Okay, um, that, this, these are style questions. So, um, you know, time versus money versus quality. Um, that's a classic, it depends, right? Um, but just be conscious of the trade-offs and be able to talk about them and, you know, have good discussions with your team about how they prioritize timing getting out quickly in order to really learn versus quality versus the money engaged in that. So just start with the language and, and have the conversation and, and even better the debate among your team. Okay. Uh, so, you know, use language to give people uh, the ability to have a conversation debate. There's no one right answer to any of those things. You know, in my career, like at Netflix, we never shipped on a schedule. We we quote shipped it when it was ready, and you know earlier when with ship wrap ship wrap software, we had to get all the kids' software into the stores by like September first in order to be successful by Christmas, right? So it just depends. Uh, there's no one answer. So how do you sell ideas to stakeholders effectively? Yeah, I use those tools, the, you know, strategic thinking, you know, sharing a vision. I'll just give you one story. Um, well, gosh, um, Greg Long worked for me at the learning company. He wanted to sign Pokemon to build kids' educational games, and he was having no success. I said, Greg, you got to help the company understand your strategic thinking, your idea, and then provide the leadership for that idea. And, and it, it, he got there. He said, listen, learning company, um, I, I want to create, using Pokemon, I want to create these not heavy educational games. He called them um, learning activities, learning games. You know, it was, it was half fun, half learning. At the time, everything was much more education oriented. Anyway, so I said, I'm going to sign Pokemon. I'm going to do these learning games. And, and what he invented, they were called Pokeroms, these little CD-ROMs. And people would collect these Pokeroms the way they would collect trading cards at the time. Okay. So in this case, I was just nicely encouraging him to be, you know, communicate his strategy, his vision. And his idea in compelling ways and just over communicate that to the organization. You know, that ended up being the most successful software. That was probably, uh, this is so long ago, 1999. Anyways, this is your job um, to, to communicate your vision of the future. And that's hard. Uh, I did write another series on LinkedIn and Medium. It's called How to Define Your Product Strategy. Um, I, it's really helpful. It's a step-by-step -step process to help product leaders to define their strategy and their vision. These, these are all learnable things, which, which I just love. Go ahead. Great. Uh, a question from Avia. Uh, I, love, I would love to ask Gibson, from the leadership and product skills, which do you consider more inherent 
and which are more teachable? God, that's a great question. Uh, inherent versus teachable. Okay, so on the right side of the list, the leadership skills. Um, I, I actually, I think leadership is a little bit more inherent, so and a little less teachable. Okay, um, just what I observe. Um, you know, recognize Irv Grosbeck was saying that I naturally wasn't going to be a great CEO. Okay, but he also knew that I naturally could be a really talented, you know, product leader. Um, okay, so then, um, actually, you know, it's interesting that the leadership skills are they're, they are harder. They're a little bit more inherent and a little less teachable. I find strategy really easy to teach. Um, culture. I've gotten better and better at teaching people, mainly help them understand why it's so important um, that people can make great decisions without talking to each other. Um, I'm not very proactive and results oriented. That's sort of inherent quality of me. Um, and then on the product side, all of consumer science is eminently teachable and learnable. Okay, And I think it's probably among the most important. Uh, people do struggle in working with other humans. You know, the management isn't natural to most folks, but a lot of it is communication and just being empathetic with your employees. Um, so you learn it by experience. Anyways, that's a really interesting question. I was thinking uh, if I write about stuff, then by nature, I think it's more teachable, right? So product strategy, you can learn it, you know, read my series. Uh, I haven't written about culture yet, but I've done lots of workshops, and I'm convinced that people can be taught it. Um, but read about all this stuff. There's wonderful books. I mean, I love reading books about startups. I, I learned so much from it. Uh, read the book uh, Zero to One if you're a startup person. Um, it's, it's a really great and simple book. Uh, read the book... Uh, the seven powers if you're interested in product strategy. Anyways. Yeah, I think that already answers some of the questions already. Um, someone asked you what exactly would be a good strategy and how do you better in it? Yeah, um, go, go just type, just type Gibson Biddle Medium on Google. And it'll take you how to define your product strategy or find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I just published those articles. Uh, I talk about a lot of stuff on Twitter, too. I don't know if people like Twitter, whatever. <laughs> yeah. The good news is I'm the only Gibson Biddle in the world. That's great. Uh, someone asked, is product leader also a company leader? Good question. Um, well, certainly there are a lot of CEOs that have that got there via product leadership, but there's a lot that got there via sales and marketing, right? Um, yeah, what's what's in so recognize if you are a product leader that turns into CEO, you got there because of all those product skills, okay? And you got there because of all those leadership skills. They're the same. Those leadership skills are the same if you're in marketing or finance or whatever else. The product skills are, are like if you're a marketer, you actually have marketing skills. They are different from the product skills, okay? Or if, you, if you're a VP of finance, your skills are finance skills. But for all of those leaders in the company, the leadership skills are the same, okay? Um, but it's kind of cool to see that increasingly there's product leaders that are also becoming the CEO of a company. And so that's kind of fun to watch. So do you feel there are significant, significant differences between a CEO who used to be a product leader versus a CEO that came from sales or operation or finance background? I do, yeah. So at Netflix, the CEO, Reed Hastings, he is a engineer, a technical, he, he's great. Um, and my joke about Reed Hastings, he never met an engineer he didn't want to hire, okay? He understands the value of engineers. 
So at Chegg, my boss was Dan Rosenzweig, who, who grew up through sales and marketing. And my joke was he never met a salesperson he didn't want to hire. Okay? Very different world. Um, now, Dan, because of his sales skills, he was very effective at raising money. And startups need to raise a lot of money. So that was helpful. And then later, we took the company public. That is a sales function, right? Um, so like product leadership, there's lots of different skills and styles of these product leaders. Same thing with CEOs. There are very different skills um, uh, and styles of CEOs depending on the company. Yeah, uh, it, startups have like rotating CEO based on yeah. the stage of the company growth, right? Whatever skills that are required at this stage for the company that uh, uh, that leader of of that domain would become the CEO. Do you recommend larger companies or even enterprises doing the same? Yeah, I think. I mean, the, what you pointed out is companies get started by an entrepreneurial person, and can that same startup CEO entrepreneur can their skills scale to the large organization? Um, and you know, I'd say about a third of the time, yes, and two thirds of the time, no. Okay, so Reed Hastings, um, he actually didn't. At first, he was involved as an investor, but he's a starter, and his skills scaled. But largely because Netflix was his second company, he learned a lot in his first company, and he learned a lot of, of you know, what not to do. Um, you know, you watch Mark Zuckerberg. He was the startup CEO, and he still continues to be the CEO. Jeff Bezos, same thing. You know, it just depends. Um, you know, at the end of the day, these founders, CEOs, they they understand the company incredibly well, right? They've got the most experience with that company, and then they're learning a lot along the way. Um, you know, remember that pyramid going from building something to building an industry. Um, and I guess, I guess, in all of these folks that scale, they are, you know, essentially lifelong learnings. So they're keenly aware of what they're good at and what they're not, and then they're, you know, dri driven by intellectual curiosity to learn all those new things. Uh, I mean, the cool thing today is being educated or taking courses so much easier in online context. Like, I don't think I would go back to business school for two years the way I did, you know, in 1990. Um, now, like I could take a, you know, an online course for a week and do one of those every quarter. I mean, that's pretty cool. The world has changed. So, okay, should we do one more question, Amanda? Yeah. Uh, someone asked, could you give examples of how you build the product team differently based on different companies' needs? What factors do you consider? Yeah, I mean, this is um, essentially organizational design. It's hard. I mean, I was thinking about management on the leadership skills, like how do you recruiting and then designing the org, who works for whom, that's hard. Uh, to answer the question, like it, I joined Netflix, there was a startup team, you know, and they actually didn't value the consumer science, the A-B testing, as much as they needed to. Um, so I actually had to rebuild the team to, to get a team that I thought could scale from 1 million members to 20 million members. And that was the sort of stage of company for me. Um, it was super important that everyone was into consumer science. Uh, at Chegg, I came in, I organized it quite similar to Netflix, and then I realized that I had gotten it wrong. And I went to a general manager structure. So we had a, um, a textbook rental company, a homework help company, and an, essentially an advertising company. Because our CEO was a salesperson, all he cared about was what was the revenues for each of these things, okay? Um, so I actually set it up as three general managers, a general manager for the textbook business, a general manager for homework health, 
and a general manager for advertising and sales. Very different structure from Netflix, probably because the CEO was very different, right? Um, anyways, it just reinforces that there's no one right answer. These are complicated issues. I did talk with a lot of my peers and mentors about you know, what should the organizational design be? Like I had people answering my texts or email or phone call in like four minutes, right? Um, so I was able to navigate those kinds of changes really quickly because I, I have this well-established personal board of directors, incredibly helpful. So I'm just gonna, that's my, my, my last reminder. The thing that you can do tomorrow is create your list of potential mentors, create your list of potential peers, and start building those relationships, okay? That's the most impactful thing that you can do tomorrow. Um, and it's actually, once you get into it, you find it easier than you expect. Great. Great. Um, thanks a ton, Amanda, for having me. Thanks, Gabby. Thanks, people all over the world for coming on out. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna let most of you go to sleep, um, but I'm gonna go get a cup of, cup of coffee because it's now, uh, 6 30 in the morning so i can begin my day wow. so anyways thank you for coming out today and thank, thank you, you for very much Gabe. uh i think uh every one of us actually i really appreciate your help and your sharing and your passion to get up so early in the morning to share yeah. with us no i'm reading the comments so thank you via thank you Varun. thank you sanchita thanks tom thanks pb thanks Agents, I'm sorry about my pronunciation. It's horrible, I'm sure. Thank you, Ilya. Um, thanks, Jonah. Jonas. So, okay. Um, good night and good morning. Good I'll night. Thanks so much, everyone. Goodbye. Good morning, Gabe. Have a nice day. Thanks. Bye bye.